morning, everyone. Morning. <coughs> I'm uh, reminded that uh, this week there's a special occasion, 4th of <laughs> July. So I uh, put on sackcloth. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but we kid around about this, but in fact, um, I think, yes, uh, in September of this year, I'll have lived 50 years in the United States. Uh, which is uh, which is twice as lo over twice as long as I lived in the United Kingdom. Uh, my father, they, my parents would visit us uh, uh, once a year, and we would, uh, when we had the money, we would go over there occasionally. But he said, "You know, Charles, this this suits you." And uh, I said, "Yes, Dad, I'm very happy, and I have I have uh, loved this country, and I love the people." Um, I'm uh, moved, however, to speculate that I wonder what uh, those who uh, f uh, fueled this revolt in uh, 1776 would think about what we have done with the freedoms that we have. Because unfortunately, we've given many of them away. And some we have misused uh, because we have not listened to the Creator, God, uh, who made it all possible. I'm sure I've told you before of a geography teacher uh, at uh, what would be called a high school here. We were going to do North America, and he rolls down the flat, uh, the map, rolls it down, and he's got a big stick, and he says, Now, boys, you're about to see the spoiled child of the world. <laughs> he point. He'd say, iron ore, coal, oil, cotton, wheat, and uh, spreading across. <laughs> because, of course, uh, you don't know, but uh, the United Kingdom imports two-thirds of its food. The United Kingdom cannot feed itself. That's why, of course, uh, the U-boat campaign in World War II, that's why the Battle of the Atlantic, as it's known, is probably one of the most pivotal battles of, of that dreadful war. Uh, however, um, we, see the, we see our country turn its back upon our God, and we see it beginning to turn its uh, hostility towards his people, too. I read lately that foster parents who are Christians are are being uh, struck from the register because they will not agree that there are more than two genders. And so the guns are turning around. But uh, I am not uh, downhearted because I know that when the Lord said that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, we just need to be uh, confident knowing that our God is greater than all of the attacks that it may level against us. We just must be faithful and uh, be ready and uh, to pray for, compassionately pray for the people who are spitting in God's face. It's not going to go well for them. I was also amusing that, uh, well, uh, on the fact that we have crossed into eight billion people on the planet. Now, of course, there's a good deal of uh, approximation in those numbers, but they're pretty much accurate, over eight billion people. Well, what is the fate of those eight billion people going to be? The most important thing that on the face of this earth is what your f fate is in eternity, not your short breath of a life here. I was looking at uh, the statistics on the religions of the world. 1.6 billion Muslims. 1.1 billion Hindus. Uh, half a billion Buddhists. Uh, 1.2 uh, held by Rome. Some will know the Lord, some will not. 
the Hindus, 1.1 billion people who think that a cow is sacred. Sounds silly, doesn't it? Until you compare it with several billion people who think that cow just came into being all of its own. That's real stupidity, okay? If you want real stupidity, that makes the Hindus look brilliant in comparison with the theory or the hypothesis, and I know I go on about this, of evolution. What a load of rubbish. Can you ever trust the reasoning of anybody who believes that to be true? Of course, we know why, because it gets God out of the picture. We just happen, we're not created. Well, Satan isn't really fussy about what sends you to hell as long as you show up there. He doesn't mind if you're a desperately religious person keeping all the rules and regulations or whether you're spurning God and saying he doesn't exist. He's not fussed. But I know that his, deep in his black heart, he hates, he hates the following words. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. How can that be? How can it be? Because we're still sinning. Satan probably calls foul, but God has accomplished this in his righteousness. And we're going to go through this, uh, these first 11 verses of uh, chapter 8 and see what the plan is, okay? I know it's plain to many of us, but we can always uh, suffer uh, reminding because it is very, very important. What has Paul said in, the, uh, in, in chapter 7? He said, you know, I am always doing what I don't want to do, and I am not doing what I do want to do. How is this working? Who is going to save me from this horrible state in which I am? And he said, thanks be to God. This is in verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. He says, wretched man that I am, in verse 24. Wretched man. That I am. We need to be wretched no longer. Okay, we can see now how the how the plan is working, and it is, of course, uh, with regard to the Spirit of God. So, it is therefore, which is consequently, consequently, there is no longer any condemnation. We have seen in chapter seven that we are dead to sin, we are no longer the slave of sin, and that we also are no longer under the law. Remember, we're not above the law, but we're no longer under the law. To be under the law is going to be death. You can't keep the law, so if we, you can't possibly be under the law still, because then we would be dead, because we can't keep it. It says for the, in verse 2 of, <clears throat> of chapter 8, it says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Jesus Christ from the law of sin and death. Let's go to John chapter 6, Gospel of John chapter 6. In verse 63, it is the Spirit who gives life. 
The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Now remember, when he, I mean, it's just wonderful that uh, the Lord Jesus would give this amazing piece of doctrine to uh, not just uh, a woman, but a woman of no, not very high repute. But we see in that interview with that woman that she, there's something uh, rather wonderful hidden in her, which is that she is uh, knowledgeable about uh, the uh, forces that are uh, about her. In other words, the, the S -S Samaritan forces which keep you out of Jerusalem, supposed to be <coughs> worshipping up in the mountains, and also the knowledge uh, that the Messiah is going to come and tell us all things, which of course is what he has done. He has told us all things. And she says to her that you must, we must, God requires to be uh, worshipped in spirit and in truth, which we are quite incapable of doing. We're not true. God is true and every man a liar. And we're not, we're not spiritual. We have, we have uh, spirit, small s, but not large. Spoken to you are spirit and life, but they are from some, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who would not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. It is the, by the power of God that we come to Christ, and it is by the power of God that we live for him. And this is what we'll see coming out. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 4 through 6. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who, ha who's, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit lives, gives life. Remember, Christ describes himself as the way, the truth, and the life. There's no life outside Christ. He is the only source of life because he is the one who grants the Spirit. Verse 3 of chapter 8, Romans chapter 8. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. Man cannot keep, man and the flesh cannot keep the law. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that we who have believed in him could have eternal life. In order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Let's go to John chapter 3. John, Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 22. After this, wait a minute, sorry, John chapter 3, verse 5. Let's hope that's the only mess up. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel 
that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. We don't look different. It isn't evident to the senses, but it is evident in our, in our conduct, in our reasoning, in everything that we think of. Also, I want to read uh, from verse four, the chapter 4. Verse 23. Wait a minute. Again, we're, I'm repeating this here, that the hour is coming that Noah will worship the Father in spirit and truth. I had already repeated in my statement. So now we go uh, to John chapter 3, back to John chapter 3, to the reference of verse 22. This is John the Baptist talking. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Aon near Salem, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to him to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John said, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore is this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, and I must decrease. Isn't it marvelous? Isn't it marvelous, his understanding of doctrine? I mean, he's got it. Of, you know, the Spirit of God, of course, is guiding him, but it's also him, the man himself. He, he, re he knows he hasn't grasped for anything. He is, he is just, as, as well, the Lord said, there's no one greater than John the Baptist in the, in the, in, in the, among men than John the Baptist. And, and this is why, you see it. He comes from above. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Here we are not, we are being taken out of the earthly people <coughs> as believers in and followers of Christ. We're no longer, as it were, spiritually speaking, of the earth. We're of the above. And we get to be that by the indwelling of the Spirit. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Here we see the union of the Godhead. We see the union of the Father and of the, and of the Son and of the Spirit. Everything is in perfect union in this operation. 
the Father loves, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This is John the Baptist. Dead on with his doctrine. Back to our text, verse 6. Sorry, verse, that, was, that was verse 5. For those who live according, verse 5, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Life and peace. We were talking uh, at uh, the men's Bible study uh, on Wednesday, and uh, we were talking about uh, how uh, idiotic uh, this uh, trend in protecting the planet. Okay, we're protecting the planet. Basically, we're oppressing people with the planet. The planet has now become the oppressor. Or actually, men are using the excuse of the planet to oppress people. To tax them and oppress them. It's as simple as that. But they actually do believe they are protecting the planet. Which is a terrific joke, of course. Now they think that things are going to last forever. And we know that the planet is set for destruction. Because God is going to wipe all of this away. Nothing will be left to remind us of this horrible, horrible mess. And so we were talking about, well, look at the fears that have been taken away from us. We're not worried about the planet. Not that we, not that we should be pumping effluent into drinking water and all this kind of thing. We have to be responsible with what's going on. And there's a, there's, there's a fine line, and, and that, of course. Um, but uh, what happens if there's an asteroid headed towards Earth that, uh, that the, the people at NASA or whatever determine that there's something coming our way that will obliterate us? Are you going to worry? No, I'm not going to worry. If it's going to obliterate us, that's the, that's the Lord's business. And maybe we've misunderstood some of what he's told us about prophecy. But nevertheless, I'm still not going to worry. That's because we have life. And we have real life. Life eternal. And we have the guarantee of it with the spirit who dwells within us and guides us and, and, and educates us. And we know it is true. If we have a worry about whether it's true or not, we ought to turn around and look at all the lies people are telling us. They're lying their heads off. Peace. We have peace. Those who are... Sorry, verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. A lot of people think that they are doing the right thing. A lot of people think that uh, they are pleasing God. But those in the flesh cannot please God. And the Lord has, says here, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, 
cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Well, how can that be? And sometimes I think that, you know, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is here to help us. He is a helper. He is not a magician. And we do not become controllers of his magic. And this is a great temptation to people. And they are believing that they are actually <coughs> controlling the Spirit of God rather than being controlled by the Spirit of God. This is very dangerous because there's somebody else who can, who can uh, fake the works and somebody who doesn't have their best interests in mind. Uh, go to Galatians. Let's go to Galatians. Right out to Second Corinthians. Uh, verse ten. Verse, uh, uh, Galatians chapter one, verse ten. For I am now seeking the approval of man or of God. He's, uh, he's railing them about the gospel that they're following, that it's really not a gospel at all. And he's uh, not pulling his punches. So he said, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Sometimes I worry about how the gospel is being uh, proclaimed. I worry about posters. Uh, you'll see them. Uh, I think it's on I-95. Uh, you'll see these posters which say, um, uh, depressed, uh, uh, go, go to Jesus. Okay. Um, that's, not, that's not the gospel. That's a, uh, that's a, um, that, that's not the problem that somebody has. The problem is they're disobedient to God and they are uh, clothed in their sin. That's what the gospel is for, not to cure you of depression. It may, in the course of which, do, do that we should hope, certainly hope. But that's not the place to start. You have to be careful how you start people because that might control where they wind up, and it may not be at the right place. <coughs> I remember uh, friends of ours were down in Washington, D.C., and there was, there was a, uh, a gospel uh, outreach going down there, and they were, they were uh, doing a, a mime, doing it in mime. And you, the people would wear a mask, and there was a Jesus person there, and uh, they would mill around in, with the masks in front, and the Jesus person would go and take their mask away. Okay. And in other words, Jesus will make me the real me. Well, me is the problem. Okay. But this is a shame. Pleasing God. I don't think those things please God. Verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. John chapter 14. Verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you 
and will be in you. Verse 10, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit of life is because of righteousness. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16. But I say to you, walk in by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Then also back to John chapter 15. Verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the world, remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me, hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. But then the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father. He will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God, and they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I do not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to be him who sent me, and none of you ask me where am I going.
But because I have said these things to you, sorrow filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I go away, the helper, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning the judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of Truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. For back to Romans 8, last verse. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. We will be resurrected. not in the way the Lord was, but we will not die. We will go to be with him. So the, the summing up here is that not only has he paid for our sins, not only has he conquered death uh, by, uh, through re his resurrection, but he has sent the Holy Spirit to us so that we can walk in him and in walking in him, we will please God. It is a decision that we have to make the entire day. It is, we, we still have the old nature and if we dwell in the flesh, then that the results will not be pleasing to God. But we have the choice now. It is unique. This relationship is unique. It is uh, exclusive and unique. There is no other type of relationship uh, that is uh, going to benefit man than this. And it is exclusive because it comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, from the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. We have a choice every moment of every day whether we are going to live in the Spirit or not. We have no excuse. We are without excuse for bad behavior. We, we, not you, me, uh, not uh, pointing the finger at me too. This is, this is convicting stuff. And we have, this happens dozens and dozens of times a day. I've asked Sandra to put something away. I find it's out again. The Spirit of God directs me to pick it up and put it away and shut up. <laughs> Poor Sandra. <coughs> Feel sorry for her. In those close relationships, it is vitally important because those are vital relationships not to be abused. I think it was uh, it was uh, Lewis, C.S. Lewis, who said, "Between here and heaven." The reins are not allowed to lie slack upon the neck of the horse. They tight.
snow riding Western guys with the, with the long reins sitting on the horn, okay? It's got to be English. <laughs> Thank you all. Bless you. Bless you for listening, okay? Okay. Now let's pray. Father, you have richly endowed us with uh, all of these strengths and, uh, and powers, not for our, at our disposal, but for our behavior and our disposition and our worship and walk with you. Thank you, Lord. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is just so vital in our lives. He gives us life, gives us truth, truth, that elusive thing on earth. And he allows us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And this pleases you. It pleases you. Let us want to please you every moment of the day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.